Jeff Rulin formed a tag team with Rick Mahorn, and the duo became one of the most intimidating front lines in NBA history. They acquired nicknames like the Beef Brothers, Cooney and Leon like the professional boxers, but Boston Celtics sports announcer Johnny Most's nickname became the most popular as he called the burly forward. Jeff Rulin was born December 16, 1958, one of six sons born to Ern and Anita Rulin. By Rulin's sophomore year at Sachem High School, he stood at over six foot seven and was already earning praise from his high school basketball coach, Tim Clauser. Jeff's a player, Clauser said. His outlet passes are a thing of beauty. Despite his size, he is also a top-notch ball handler and can play equally well in the bucket or the corner. By his senior year, Rulin was one of the most sought-after players on the East Coast. A basketball scholarship was welcome, as his carpenter father had died and his mother supported the family by running Ernie's Tavern in Holtzville, New York. Numerous big-time college programs, including Kentucky and Indiana, recruited him, but it was a fast-talking coach named Jim Valvano that lured him to Iona, a small Catholic college north of New York. Come and dare to dream, Valvano said to the young high school star. Rulin listened and signed with Iona in 1977. I already knew half the guys on their team because I had played with them on the playgrounds, Rulin said. I liked the coach too, but the main thing was that my mother would get to see me play. Rulin soon saw a father figure in the charismatic Valvano, going so far as to give his coach Christmas gifts during his time there. Not many guys who have had their fannies kissed as big shot high school athletes would do that, Valvano said. But that's the kind of feeling we want to develop here. If I can win and still have the players for my friends, that's what I want. Rulin's transition from high school into college was a learning experience. He never encountered home court advantage like he did when he was on the visiting side with Iona. One of the refs called a foul on me, Rulin said, and I made the mistake of glaring at him. The look on his face told me I was in trouble. Sure enough, he had me out of the game in a matter of minutes. Every time a call could have gone either way, it went against me. Rulin led the nation's freshmen in scoring, rebounding, and field goal percentage. Now at 6 foot 10 and 245 pounds, he looked like a shoe-in to be a first-round draft choice. The expectations for Iona College in his sophomore year started to grow out of proportion. The team lost four of its first 11 games, and the critics started to come out in droves. We feel we're letting half the Western world down because Iona lost a college basketball game, Valvano said. I could see that in my players' eyes. A critical news article on Ruland also affected him personally. He's a very sensitive kid, Valvano said. He couldn't understand why someone would write that about him. It's tough to read when you're 18 years old and that you're not measuring up. Still, opposing teams were giving Ruland respect, sagging in on him on defense sometimes with three men. Ruland was also responsible for the increase in fan interest. When Valvano first started coaching, there were only 15 season ticket holders. Now there were more than 700 with an average attendance of over 2,600 at the 3,000-seat Mulcahy Center. In the 1979-80 season, the Iona Gales finished with a record of 29-5 and and announced themselves as a team on the rise when they took on the number two ranked Louisville Cardinals at Madison Square Garden. Looking at the ball club, Dave, I think Ruland's a little bit fat and out of shape. He's not as lean and wiry as Wiley Brown or Derek Smith. And the pace of the game could tell. Iona controls the tip. Well, he's playing a one-man zone. Next time we can, the cameras could just stay on rule, and he doesn't move much from out there. But here he's making his move. Oh, that's a quick move, too. Stolen by Iona. Put up. That's no good. And a foul against Rodney McRae. That's it against that full-court pressure. All right, that's the second turnover for Iona. 
It is 18 to 12, Louisville by trailing Iona by six. 18,000 fans here tonight in beautiful Madison Square Garden to see the top two teams in college basketball. Derek makes his move. Would have been playing a little scary now, but first of all, if you don't do this when you're behind. Now you can do that and go for the crowd when you're ahead, but not when you're behind. If he gets in trouble, we're in trouble. Well, I tell you, when they go into Jeff Rowland, he yes, got the roll on that one. Daryl Griffith show is on TV now. Ten points in the game for Daryl. We're midway or halfway through the first half, and Louisville trailing by four at 22-18. Iona on the attack. It's Vickers out front over to Palma looking inside for Rulin. Well, he's strong when he goes up there, but he missed that shot from inside. Rulin, one of the foul, didn't get it. And each and half are going to be important because if the Cardinals can get back in the ballgame, it's a different game. The second half tip, as was true in the first half, controlled by Iona. Vickers to the left side to Hamilton. Bombs away by Kevin Hamilton. The two team in the country, the Louisville Cardinals, in trouble. Roland, hook shot, no, rebound at Palma, saves it back to Roland. Vickers, no, drops it back out to Hamilton. But the guys underneath there, Middleton, and there he goes. Oh, Roland with a good move, Roland with a smooth move. He's not going to end tonight, we said that on the opening of the show. Roland inside, boy, he is strong at 6'10 and 240, he scored 22 tonight. For the number two team in the country, Roland lays it up. It's good. It's all over. Iona then won the ECAC Metro Basketball Tournament, which earned them a bid into the NCAA tourney. They defeated Holy Cross in the opening round, only to fall to the Georgetown Hoyas by a score of 74 to 71. Later, Roland made the claim that he believed that a couple of his games at Iona were fixed. In the Georgetown game. He said that his friend's father wanted to bet on the contest, but according to Ruland, was told that, quote, all bets were off because they found out I was going to get three fouls in the first minute. Ruland did get into early foul trouble in the game, recalling that, quote, one of the calls was under the basket and I was standing at half court. Right there, I said to myself, hey. The tournament exposure also put Ruland in the crosshairs of sports agents like Paul Corvino. He said he would make me a wealthy young man, Ruland recalled. He said I was the great white hope and that he'd get me commercials. He told me how great I was. Corvino privately described Ruland as cuckoo and not too bright, but he wanted to bring the college star into the NBA at top dollar. He wanted Ruland to go hardship like Spencer Haywood did years earlier, but he didn't realize that signing a professional contract before the playing year began was a violation of NCAA rules. The signing cost Ruland the remainder of his collegiate eligibility. Ruland now had no choice but to turn pro, but his market value dropped. Ruland was drafted by the Golden State Warriors in the second round. Instead, he went to play pro basketball in Barcelona, Spain, in a year that he could have been playing with Iona, if not for his involvement with Corvino. One sports writer described Corvino as the Dracula of the sport, with Ruland having the fang marks to prove it. The Warriors traded his rights to the Washington Bullets, and he joined the squad in the 1981-82 season, ironically backing up another historical hardship case in Spencer Haywood. Rulin made the all-star rookie team, and after Haywood abruptly retired, he became a starter, leading the team in scoring and rebounding. Rulin joined forces with Rick Mahorn, and the duo terrorized the league under the names the Beef Brothers, McFilthy and McNasty, and Cooney and Leon. Mahorn was called Leon because of the Leon Spinks-like gap between his teeth and Ruland was nicknamed Cooney after the heavyweight boxer when he punched Alvin Adams of the Phoenix Suns. The Beef Brothers earned a reputation of not backing down from anyone, even superstars like Michael Jordan. 45-28's the score, Chicago's led the entire game. Jordan walked that time. Ooh, and Jordan went up and came down hard and is injured. You can't go up against Jeff Ruland in that matter. And Jeff was just standing there and he went up, even though the whistle and play was had been called dead. I think we'll get a chance to see this. He went up strong against Jeff Ruland and he came down really hard. The play was called. Jeff goes up and makes a good defensive attempt and his leg gets caught on Jeff's shoulder. And he comes down hard. He's okay. He's all right. I think he's taking a breather more than anything. Well, he wants to know how his fans are taking it. <laughs> 
In his first three seasons with the Bullets, Rulin committed over 916 fouls. League villain Bill Lambeer only committed 889. Rulin had his best year in the 1983-84 season. He was the only player in the league who ranked in the top 10 in three major statistical categories, scoring, rebounding, and field goal percentage. He now had a complete game, possessing the quick and agile moves of a small forward, but also having the imposing size of a center. His harshest critics now conceded that they were wrong about him, and the Bullets made the playoffs, taking on the number one seeded Boston Celtics. Thank you, Brent. You know, you guys have, have done everything you wanted to do with, with Boston except win, of course. What are you going to do now? What's next? We're just going to keep the same game plan and uh, hope we go to the free throw line a few more times. Yeah, now, Jeff, inside, you've had a lot of assists, not enough points. They've been double, triple teaming you. you got to get a little tougher in there. Oh, well, you can't go around three guys. Uh, we've had the open jump shot, and uh, when they double and triple team, I have to pass the ball out. There's no other alternative. Yeah. Will it help to be at home? Will the fans help you? I hope so. Uh, we don't have a packed house, but uh, we'll take what we got. But you're ready to go. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Right. Good luck today, Jeff Rulin. Johnson brings to the attack for the Bullets. Bird knocks it away from Mahorn. Sobers gets it inside to Rulin. Perry's trying to force Rulin out away from the basket. And they go to Sobers with a three-point throw. Ballard with a strong rebound attempt. Rulin on the other side. He can occupy Larry Bird because he can score on the offensive end. Stolen by Sobers. Ruland is on his right. Crashes inside. 10 37 the count in that one. Sobers inside. Ruland. Sobers. Ruland. Johnson. Mahorn. Sobers sends it to Rulin. Hits the layup. They're taking real charge of this game. Rulin hooks. For the stretch. Ballard. Rulin. Frankie Johnson's back. Next series, he fully expects it to be ready, but this one could be far from over. Danny watching from the Celtic bench. Inside the Ruland, who now has 27 points. Ballard straddles and gives to Ruland. Ruland is hit by Dennis Johnson, and he will come to the free throw line with nine seconds to go. 13 seconds were wasted. They could have fouled right away. They were trying to foul him in the backcourt. They were not able to do it. So that's 13 seconds wasted. And now Boston will call timeout no matter if Ruland makes either shot. If he makes one or two or misses both, they should call timeout to set it up. They still have an opportunity on a three-point play. It's been this kind of an afternoon for Jeff Rulin. 31 points, 13 rebounds, 5 of 6 from the free throw line. And these perhaps the most important. This is still a big shot right now without three-point play rule. If he misses that, there's a lot of Boston players that can shoot it from out deep. But now they'll need more than that. To get in the position to win, you got to give an awful lot of credit for that. Three-pointer. And the Bullets have beaten the Celtics 111 to 108. The Celtics won the next game, eliminating the Bullets. The following year, injuries hit Ruland despite the fact that he was never injury prone and had led the NBA in minutes played the past season. He needed surgery on his right shoulder after lifting weights. Then 30 games into the season, he broke his foot when he came down on another player's foot. I was a workhorse, Ruland said. That's what made the injury so frustrating. I never had to put up with him before. Ruland missed the entire year before being traded to the Philadelphia 76ers for the 1986-87 season. The trade was later seen as one of the worst in the history of the 76er franchise, as Ruland was included in a deal that cost the team Moses Malone and draft choice Brad Doherty. 
His foot injuries had become chronic, with Rulin stating that he almost passed out from the pain. Also, the cartilage in his knee had eroded and he had to retire. There I was, Rulin said, out of the league at age 28. I was on the verge of having to walk with a cane. The knee got worse every year. There was a continual swelling and it was to the point where I couldn't even bend it. Amazingly, Rulin made a comeback five years later with the Sixers at age 33. Thanks to the skill of his knee surgeon and determined rehabilitation on Rulin's part, he rejoined the NBA. I'll be the best backup center in the league, Rulin said, but that's not hard to do. I mean, look around at some of the backups. I'll give them the hardest 20 to 25 minutes you've ever seen. But the Cinderella comeback was short-lived. Rulin played in 13 games for the 76ers before a porter pushing a luggage cart at the Boston Garden ran over his foot, rupturing his Achilles tendon. The following year, he managed to play 11 games for the Detroit Pistons before calling it quits for good at age 34. I was at the prime of my career, Rulin said, one of the top 24 basketball players in the world. Then I woke up one day and couldn't do it anymore. Rulin found success as a coach on the collegiate level, returning to his alma mater, Iona College, and leading them to three NCAA tournament appearances in his nine years as their coach. He currently works for the Washington Wizards as a talent scout.